I'm Peter Brown from Tiny and Sons Glass. Tiny and Sons Glass was established in 1978 when my father and brother and I were at 575 Washington Street in Pembroke. We're certified and qualified to do all your windshield replacement and repair. Tiny and Sons Glass is a community-based business. We have 12 mobile vans that come to you. If the weather's bad, you can come here to the shop. We have a nice waiting area, TV, Wi-Fi, kid-friendly, pet-friendly. We also can move about 15, 20 cars a day through the shop. Perfect for you when the weather's bad. So come on down to Tiny and Sons Glass if you need your windshield replaced or repaired. Tiny and Sons Glass, 1-888-64-TINYS. Just call. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the November 13th Board of Selectmen meeting. And we'll start by a pledge of allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, tonight, mm -hmm. but, uh, I just wanted to say a couple of words about uh, on Saturday we went to uh, junior high school for uh, Veteran Day event down there and it uh, was very well attended and um, we just wanted to let everybody know that we appreciate our vets very much. Year, they take one kid from each one of the elementary schools and uh, they talk about what they think of it is. And, uh, it was pretty interesting. It was a good day. And, uh, thanks again to the best. <coughs> so we do have a public hearing right at 7 o'clock here. It's the Board of Assessors for uh, FY18 tax classification here. Good evening. Good evening. Can I set for A bunch of assessors here. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, that time of year again already. We're here for classification. Um, with me is the uh, Board of Assessors. We've got the Chairman of the Board, Mary Quill, and Board Members, Libby Bates and Elaine Borden. And we also have our Assistant Assessor, Jean Gelati, here tonight. Um, I'll tell you quickly, uh, I've been out on medical leave for the past few weeks. I'm happy to be back and be healing well. Um, but in my absence, the assistant assessor had to take over the uh, operations of the office, and she did uh, an outstanding job. I'm very thankful to have her. My board is appreciative of all her work. And because this is my first day back, she actually prepared the presentation. So what we're going to do tonight is Jeannie's going to come up and give the majority of the presentation. Um, I'll come back up just at the end um, and go over one item, and then we're going to open it up to you guys for questions. So. Why don't we just get right into it, Judy, and you can come on up. Hi, everybody. Um, so right now, obviously, we're here for the tax classification hearing. And this is where the Board of Selectmen votes on whether or not to have a uniform, which is a single rate, or a split tax rate. So the fiscal year 18 estimated tax levy, and that's the amount raised through property taxes, is estimated to be approximately $40 million. And this is approximately 60% of the town's entire budget. The total valuation of the town is close to $2.7 billion. Now that gives us an estimated tax rate of $14.89 per thousand. Now again, tonight you're not voting on the tax rate. You're only voting on whether or not to have a split or a uniform rate. Now, fiscal year 18 values are done by class, and that is by use. Residential have a value of about $2.3 billion. Commercial has a value of $232 million. Industrial, close to $86 <coughs> million. Personal property, close to $38 million. And that gives you the total of the $2.7 billion in value. Now, this shows you what the percentage is for each class. As you can see, residential obviously is the highest amount of close to 87% of the value of the town, followed by commercial at 8.6, industrial at 3.2, and 
and then the personal property is a little better than 1% of the total value of the town. So this is the community comparison for fiscal year 17, which is the last year. It has the majority of the Plymouth County towns in it. These are only single rate towns. They don't have any of the split tax rates up there. But it gives you the average single family tax bill for last year. And as you can see, Wareham is the cheapest place to live at a little under $2,800. And Deluxeberry is at a little under $10,000 in the average single family tax bill. Pembroke is number nine, showing that they're in the lower half of the average tax bill for a town. The average fiscal year 18 assessment for a residential single family is a little better than 373000 Using the anticipated tax rate of 1489 that gives the residential average tax bill 5564 Now the average commercial property assessment is a little more than a million dollars, giving the average commercial tax bill, again using that estimated tax rate of 1489 of $15,418 per year. This is an overview of the past couple of years and the values, valuations and the taxes and what have happened. Now, as anyone knows and what's going on with the real estate market right now, values are definitely on the upswing, as you can see from looking at this. In 2016, the average single family was valued at about 345. It jumped up in 17 to 359. And then 18, our average tax bill, our average single family value is about 373000 Now, as you can see from the bottom, they have the tax amount, the change in the amount of taxes from year to year. Between 17 and 18, we're looking at the tax bill of the average family to the increase approximately $144. Between 16 and 17, the increase was about the same at 146 and then between 15 and 16, it was $359. That little higher jump is due to the Proposition 2.5 override that was done from the schools. So a split tax rate. If your average, if your taxes, your assessment right now is $100,000, and using the anticipated tax rate of $1489, you're going to be paying $1,489 in taxes. If you had a million dollar property, you're going to pay $14,890. That's with the uniform tax rate. If you split the tax rate, it shifts the burden from the residential to the commercial, <coughs> industrial, and personal property class. This is just gives you an overview as if you have if you have a percentage between 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 percent shift from commercial, from residential to commercial. It's a little easy to see on this slideshow. It gives you an easy breakdown to look at. So if you had a 10% shift, in order for the average residential single family tax payer to save $85 per year, the average commercial taxpayer would be at the additional burden of $1,542 per year. Now if you had a 50% shift, the average residential single family taxpayer to save $426, the average commercial taxpayer would be at the additional burden of more than $7,700 per year. So it's because of these reasons and others that the Board of Assessors has voted to recommend that the Board of Selectmen adopt a single uniform tax rate. And now we're going to have Kathy Salmon come up and she is going to discuss the small commercial exemption possibility. Thank you. Okay, so the last item to consider is this small commercial exemption. Um, there is a provision in the law that says if the selectmen so uh, choose, they can vote to have uh, two different rates for commercial. Uh, who qualifies for a small commercial exemption? There are a lot of rules, but you have to be a sole proprietor or partnership. You can have no more than 10 employees. The property and where your business is can't exceed an assessment of a million dollars. And the Department of Labor and Workforce actually puts out the list of who they say qualifies. Um, 
the benefit or the intended benefit was to say, well, we're going to take these small businesses and let them pay something a little bit less, and whatever savings they have, we're going to shift on to the bigger businesses. That was the intent. Um, but the things to consider are that, um, in practice, it's, it's very difficult to track. Um, one of the things that happens in commercial property, many times the small businesses don't own the real estate. So um, the savings go to the owner of the building, which doesn't necessarily then translate to the small businesses that happen to be tenants in that building. The other problem is, is many times you have small businesses in both properties that are under the million dollars and in larger properties that are, might be in a $5 million property. They just happen to be located as a small tenant within that. So there would be no way to um, be sure that if you're shifting it, that all of the small businesses are really benefiting from that. And in fact, there's no way to avoid shifting onto some of these small businesses that are in some of these larger complexes. Um, so we have year after year looked at this. Um, and very few communities have actually adopted it. Again, it was a good idea, but in practice, it's just difficult to get that benefit down to the small businesses that it was intended to go to. So the board um, made a vote uh, prior to this meeting to recommend to you that you vote no on the small commercial exemption. So at this point, I'll take any questions that you have. And then we're going to need two votes from you. First, do you want to go with the single or split tax rate? And second, yes or no on the small commercial exemption. And then finally, I would just ask that we keep this hearing open until we hear back from the Department of Revenue. Um, when we get final word from them, then I um, notify you that the hearing can be formally closed. So I will take any questions or comments that anybody has. Oh, sure. uh, thank you. <clears throat> so, Kathy, I think the board understands. Uh, we've, we've seen this uh, year in and year out <clears throat> on uh, the tax split rate classification and uh, the small commercial exemption. But why are here? Can you just, for the public's benefit, explain how each residential property is assessed? Explain the process uh, sure. because folks don't get a chance to hear from you that often. Sure. Um, so every year we value property according to the market. And so I'll keep it really brief, but you know, we get all of the sales, we get every deed from the registry of deed that takes place in a year. We analyze those deeds to make sure we're looking at you know, good market sales, not you know, somebody to their uncle or discounted sales. But we get a good group of sales, and then we value them according to market. Now, one thing you have to remember is we are always looking backwards. So the values that we're talking about, that Jeannie was telling you, our total value is 2.7 billion. This is for fiscal 18. So the bills that come out in January are going to have a value on them. That value is actually based on the 2016 sales. So sometimes people think, you know, the assessments are always lower than what I could really get in the market. Um, we do value at 100% of market. It's just dated. So by the time your bill comes out for fiscal 18, that will be January um, of 2018. That bill that you get in January 2018 is based on the 16 sales. So there is always this lag. And when the market is increasing, you're going to think your assessment's a little bit lower, or sometimes a lot lower than what the market is. And the reverse is true. Sometimes when the market's decreasing, your assessment could be higher than what it is worth currently. So that's kind of one of the big differences. But each and every year, we go out. Um, we're always inspecting properties. We have to reinspect over a period of years. So we're always out collecting the data on the property to make sure that what we're basing your assessment on is accurate. And at the same time, we're measuring the market to say, what's happening? Is it going up? Is it going down? In certain segments change to a certain degree. So that's a quick review of how we do it. But we do change them each and every year. I just would like to thank Dan for that question because I think that's very important for the people at home to understand, including myself, how all that works. Mm -hmm. And I was a little fuzzy on that, but you have cleared that up tonight and I'm sure other people at home are going to feel the same way. Okay. Because we all look at how our homes are assessed and we probably don't always agree
agree that we would sell our house for that amount. We right. always think it's worth more. Yes. So now we can understand that maybe we're not wrong. That's that's correct. So our assessment could be right, and at the same time you could right. be right that you could get something more for your house. Both those things are often <coughs> happen at the same time. And I also think that again this year the uh, assessors and yourself and, uh, have explained what our choices are. We've always had a lot of questions about the single rate, the commercial rate. Mm -hmm. But again, you've outlined them all again. I think we're all familiar with it. And uh, I, I myself would uh, think that we should go with your recommendations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, the same question that they had. So okay, so you're set. All right. I'm sorry, I stepped on. All right. <laughs> Um, if we're ready, I would move the um, recommendation that the Board of Assessors that we adopt the single tax rate. Second. That's, uh, now open for discussion, and I would also agree uh, with that. Is, um, I can't see punishing the uh, businesses um, where there's more residential than there are businesses. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. Uh, it makes sense to, as far as the uh, small commercial so, so. Okay. I'm also ready for more. All right. Hey, Bill, can I just, uh, just a little further? Uh, and again, we, we speak of this every year. Uh, but a question I get from some folks is, well, please help the, the residents with their tax bill. And uh, this is one way to do that, one, one possible way. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's important for, for the folks at home to know that as you explained in your, for, to, to highlight what you explained in your, your PowerPoint presentation, uh, Gene and Kathy, is that to gain a very small amount for the residents, it's a tremendous burden to, to the commercial properties. So uh, that's clear to us, and I just want people to think that we're taking this vote quickly and lightly. We, we, we study this, we know this every year, uh, but that, that is the case. We, we, we can't help the residents in this town. We just don't have enough commercial property to make it a, a good enough benefit to do so. And one other point that sometimes has come up over the years is it's important to remember what is the residential. We think of it as the homeowners that are looking for relief, but this is all use. So if you were to split it, we have um, you know, an approximate $40 million apartment complex. You might think of that as a business property, but that's actually residential because it's all according to use. So in a town where you split the rate, that actually would receive discounts. And so commercials of all different sizes would be making up for that. Um, so that's just one to think of on the residential because it isn't always just the single families that push their our biggest group. But the other thing that we have to consider uh, within Pembroke is we have a lot of chapter properties. These are properties that are either in forestry, open space, farmland. And under the master of the laws, when you split a rate, they're considered commercial. So they actually would be paying at the higher rate. So it isn't just you know the strip mall and the single family house. It's even beyond that. The majority reason is, is what you just said, Dan. It is that we have so many more residential. But it's also the makeup of our property. You do have to consider all of those things. And kind of for all of those reasons, it continues to not make sense uh, for the town. Good. We have a motion on the second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody five to zero? Mr. Chairman, I would move that we adopt the uh, recommendation of the Board of Assessors and not adopt the small commercial exemption. Second. Any questions or comments? Okay, we'll just keep it open and we'll notify you when we're all set. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Again, a very nice presentation. It just explains a lot to us. Very good. Thank you. Almost right on the mark here. We got 
we got another minute to go, but I guess we could probably take a minute early. Uh, 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 Andrew Sullivan is here to request to reconstruct the community center task force and appoint some members. Mr. Sullivan. I'm um, going by that clock, Billy. It's uh, 21 past, so. <laughs> How are you guys doing today? Right by, though. <laughs> Good to see you all. Um, yeah, how does this work? Do I, uh, um, if you, I think if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about what you want to do and how okay. you do it or whatever. And, uh, so I don't, I'm terrible with dates. Sabrina, maybe help me. When did I first come before you guys to uh, request the committee? Might have been less than a year ago, but any event, um, some time back, I approached you all to uh, inquire about the community center. Just kind of, you know, I'm just getting back involved in some town activities. I've uh, had a child playing hoops at the community center, and I got to spend some time there. Of course, growing up in the town, I re remember the community center well. So um, it's just, um, you know, I'm not saying it as an outsider's point of view, but as someone who hadn't really uh, been focusing too closely on the uh, goings on in the town. I just looked around and I, I thought the building, um, I was really kind of shocked to see the state of the, the building. And um, after doing some inquiry, I learned there was uh, several committees from years past. There was a large committee some eight years ago, 25 member committee. And um, you folks were nice to uh, open up the books to me to see uh, all the notes from those previous committees Sabrina shared with me. And, um, you know, uh, we had talked about you had given me the latitude to go out and look for committee members to start a study group to, to uh, readdress the community center and um, look at past committee's work and um, maybe take a fresh look at it. So, you know, we haven't had a committee form officially yet, but that's what I'm here for tonight. Uh, we just have four members we're looking to put on the committee tonight, including myself. But, um, I've, I have been unofficially talking to a lot of folks that have uh, participated in the committee from before and uh, met with some consultants and what have you to uh, look at the 30 acre property, look at the building a little closer. And uh, so we're just starting to, just starting to review uh, the work that had been done to date to see what might be relevant from eight years back. and. Um, but at this point, yeah, I think we're ready to, you know, go official. Hopefully, uh, you'll grant us these uh, new committee members that are Pembroke residents that were very active in the committee before. I certainly um, hope we can leave it open for more committee members, uh, for real <coughs> solid individuals, I think, to uh, start it off. But I, there's some areas, I think, uh, that are key to this project that are not addressed by our committee members today that are uh, still kind of looking for filling in some uh, gaps for some uh, you know, grant writing, for instance. You know, really it would be helpful to find someone in the town that has some experience with that. I think there's some opportunities with this project uh, through grants. And uh, as we all know, it comes down to the financing, and uh, that's the biggest challenge. We can dream of a wonderful new building there, but at the end of the day we have to pay for it. So um, that's, uh, that will obviously be uh, one of the more challenging uh, points of the project is to address the financing side of it. So you know, we, can come, we can dream up a wonderful community center, but um, it has to be paid for at the end of the day. So um, Anyway, I'm excited about the project. You know, it's to me, it's just this amazing resource in the middle of our town. It's 30 acres, and no area town has such a large tract of land in the middle of their town that um, has such great potential. And it's really in a sad state today. And I think all the townspeople are pretty much in agreement that the building has outlived its life cycle, and uh, it's. Um, it needs to be addressed, and uh, hopefully we can we can come back to you with some uh, interesting ideas for what what can happen there. So, 
first step is, I guess, going official with the committee with you and uh, getting these committee members sworn in with me and uh, really rolling up our sleeves. We really look forward to getting uh, input from townsfolk on their thoughts on it and uh, sharing with them some of the, I the new fresh ideas that we have as well. So that's where we're at. Uh, the four committee members we're looking to add are Ralph Coppola, Dan Trabuco, Mike Gamars, and, and myself. And we have Tony Marino on this too. Is he the Mike Gamars? He not currently. He doesn't Oh, okay. And he just took a new job too, so it's a little busy. He, I'm sure he will donate his time, but mm -hmm. right. the appointment will be problematic at the moment. Come here, let's we should take motion, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, move to reorganize the inactive community task force with the following five members Andrew Sullivan, Dan Ruco, Ralph Capella, and Michael Guimaraes. Uh, and uh, we'll pause for a minute in case someone has another name to add with here. If not, that there was one on the Anthony Marino. Uh, he's not a resident. He's not a resident. So he's not a resident. Oh, he's a building inspector. Assistant building inspector. And he just took a job as town manager, interim town manager in Hanover, so he's a little busy. So I think have the, those are the Second. names, unless... Yep. So I'm, a little, I'm a little new to this, but I guess with a, being an official town committee, we'll have uh, this reporting methods, and I've got that booklet on, uh, I'm sure you can help walk me through it, Dan, but, uh, you know, it's, we schedule meetings, we post it, and everybody's... Um, find meeting space here or wherever. And yeah, sure. So um, this is how it works, Andrew, is uh, Warrer's chairman, and uh, let's, uh, part of my motion will be to make Andrew chairman. Sorry, we took a minute. And uh, hopefully it's seconded. <laughs> I hope you don't mind, Andrew. Uh, so how could I say? Uh, we sent an agenda yeah. uh, to, to Sabrina. Uh, three days prior to the meeting. Uh, so generally the meetings are, uh, well, Mondays are obviously taken up, so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever's best for the votes. And, uh, and then the minutes are taken. If the chairman does not have to take the minutes. Someone in the, in the committee can take the minutes. Uh, simple as taking notes, uh, but those have to, have to be written and voted on by the committee at a subsequent meeting and, uh, and submitted to the town. Okay. So it, it's, I'll walk you through it. Please okay. 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 Awesome. Yeah, we're looking forward the to getting it. easy enough. It's just getting someone to do it. It's right. <laughs> the hard part, especially for the minutes. Right. Uh, and then part of that is, and we haven't taken the, the, the vote yet, I know, Bill. But uh, there's also, Andrew, uh, a call for a capital funding study committee that someone, and I expect you, from this committee would, would want to be a part of that uh, because uh, all, all the stuff you mentioned a moment ago uh, about funding for this project is, uh, is integral to whatever that committee does. Right. So this capital funding study committee, uh, you would certainly want to be a part of that and, uh, and listen and participate. Okay. So more work. Thanks for volunteering. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we'll keep me posted on that, but look forward to participating in that as well. Right. So, uh, okay. So we do have a motion and a second. And there's an amendment. We do a little bit of a change on that to add the end of the solid mesh to it. Yes. Yeah, cool. uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? May I have a question, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Sullivan. Yes. Uh, you've uh, gone over the two previous studies on that property. Pretty much the last one of eight years ago. I don't. I didn't find too many notes on any of the one prior to that. Okay. Well, the point is that the board is very familiar with the studies that were done on that building, and I was just wondering what your opinion was on it. It was either a couple of choices. One is to rehab the entire building, making it into another type of a building, but using the structure that's there now, and the other one was to tear it down and start new. So are you in basically in agreement that 
we would be starting new or that we could do something with that building? I, you know, the numbers that were presented to me from eight years back had a cost analysis and the, the complete teardown of it was less than the remodel of it, was the bottom line. I mean, there was some pretty good numbers gathered, you know, but um, there's asbestos remediation, you know, that, mm -hmm. that I'm still waiting to, f I'm trying to find the actual survey that was done that was came in at 325,000 for asbestos <coughs> remediation and it was, that was more than the demolition of the structure. But um, from everything I've seen, the facts would state, you know, that it was cost prohibitive to rebuild the structure mm -hmm eight years ago and that would only be more true today. So as you see uh, where your committee is going to go is to use the premise that we would uh, demolish that particular building, this would be a general plan and we would end up building another building of some type based on the use for that building. Is that I would say that go? would be the direction would, yes, okay. most likely. I really don't think much effort would need is, needs to be spent on considering rehabbing after all the work that was done eight years ago. So, you know, I'm a history buff. I'm, you know, I, l I live in a house built in 1715, and, uh, you know, I love the history of Pembroke. I love the historic nature of it. So I do appreciate that there's some historic qualities to that school it was built as a school in 1932 and um, you know that there's a definitive look to downtown Pembroke that I'm I probably fall into the historic camp on and um, so any new structure and Ralph Coppola who's been quite involved with this has mm -hmm. a lot of thoughts on this as well the aesthetics of a new structure should really embrace the historic values of the town so you know the more I look around the properties too. I think they did a wonderful job with the library. I think the the exterior of the new library out back is is a really nice asset for the town. And I think whatever we consider for the community center would embrace that. And really, they're kind of sister functions in my mind. That libraries today are very multi-purpose facilities. It's not you know they're kind of serving the purposes of a community center in their own way. So, you know, these would be sister operations and they could look alike. I, I remember you mentioned it, Arthur, you know, a tie-in to the library, I mean, you know, to how they could potentially be connected. I don't think that was really investigated much some eight years back. No, it wasn't, but to put it in the architectural lines with the building, right. I think you're right on track. You know, the thing with the library is funny. I mean, it's such a beautiful building. You really don't see it from the street. It's pretty concealed out front. You, know, you catch glimpses of it, but, you know, when it does open up, I mean, the, the front, you know, front part of that library is very impressive. And, uh, you know, there's, it's, you know, this, the sight lines, the whole site, it, you really got to look at the other adjacent properties and how this could all tie in and lots to think about. And we're really just at the surface here. And, uh, I look forward to getting a lot of input from a lot of people, and I, I really think it's you know it's going to it's going to take a few years, but long term, I, I really think you know we have to do something about the building anyway. It's in bad, bad shape, and I don't think anyone wants to drive by a condemned building in the middle of our town. So you know we have to face the elephant in the room here a little bit, and that uh, this structure is in in uh, disrepair and. Hopefully we can get creative about it and figure out uh, some funding sources and some partnerships that can now uh, make this happen. And you know, it really can have a wonderful campus feel to it. I was talking to Debbie Wall of, in the library, and I, some years before the eight-year committee, there was talk of a campus feel. You know, we have town buildings all in the same area, and it's all it's all part of one campus. Really, you think of a university campus and how all the buildings fit together and uh, that's a really interesting uh, thought process to consider for our whole downtown area beyond the community So uh, I was discussing with Andrew uh, a couple of weeks ago some of his initial conceptual ideas um, and part of some of his ideas included 
uh, building community center build a new community center building, but also uh, fitting into that building the uses that are already existing in a couple of buildings out front. Um, uh, the building that the elderly folks use is the, uh, the boys club building. And if we could take those buildings that are on the street with public access on the street, as long as the uses that are included there now are in the newer building, uh, lease those buildings out and those spaces out to commercial businesses as a way to uh, supplement the funding for the, for the building itself. So that'll have a dual purpose, right, Andrew? That those historic buildings that are out front on the, on the street uh, will remain uh, as the structures they are, but the use will change to a business and, and make Pembroke more vibrant with street presence businesses. And also, as part of uh, his conceptual project, uh, look at the project that uh, included housing in the back, alongside, uh, you know, the housing that's behind the, the post office area? Down in what's the ball field now, include uh, housing in that area. So it's a, it's a mix of residential, community center, and businesses now using the buildings that are in front. So uh, Andrew is before us now to start the committee, but he's been doing a lot of work in the last uh, 12 months or so that he's been looking into, not even 12 months. So he, he has some good ideas. Uh, the folks that he's already been talking with have some good ideas. Uh, presenting the plan and getting the funding for it is, uh, are the next steps. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. That's it? That's it. We're all set. All right. We'll report back soon, I hope. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for coming in. The agenda was the advisory committee, and we're going to talk about pension liability analysis and community content for the five to ten year plans. Yeah. Yeah.